Thank you, thank you, Tessa. Good afternoon. Um, well, first of all, my most enthusiastic congratulations to the Third World Study Center on its 35th anniversary. Um, I first came into contact with the Third World Studies Center back in the 80s when the Institute of the Center had an active role to play in one of the research networks of the United Nations University. It's not by chance that the Third World Studies Center was organized in 1977 because that was the decade of development. The 1970s were declared by the UN as the development decade. And everybody had very high hopes during that decade. With the group of 77, we had UNTAD, we had a new international economic order. We thought now was the time for the third world to come into maturity and development in the international economy. So it was also not by chance. This is the right thing. It's also not by chance that the uh, United Nations University, with which I was connected, had a very important research project towards the end of that decade, which was the Johan Galton, you mentioned, the TESA um, research on the goals, processes, indicators of development. It was a supposed to be an attempt to rethink the development problematic from the ground up. Within that group, there were some scholars who, even then, 79, 1980, were already thinking that perhaps it's not so much development we should be looking at, but what really are the chances, real possibilities of development within the system that we had at that time. Um, I have something for uh, Chancellor Sosoma. Um, he pointed very, very neatly. Actually, I played on that choice of words precisely because uh, Wither and Wither uh, already posed the question uh, in a quite, quite, uh, shall we say, um, uh, mischievously. <laughs> but um, in fact, and this is a curiosity here. According to world system theory, the third world does not exist. Um, what we have is a tripartite scheme where you have a center and a large periphery and in the middle a small semi-periphery. Now these are not necessarily countries. These refer rather to economic processes of varying degrees of money-making capacities. And of course, those economic processes that make the most money, leading industries, monopolistic, quasi-monopolistic, and breaking in millions and millions and millions of dollars, go right there at the core. The periphery is the market, is the source of raw materials, and is the source of labor to be used in the system. Within the core countries, there are also peripheral activities taking place, just as in the periphery countries, there are core activities also taking place. So, it is a matter of weight, weighting, right? And of course, because of that, we can say that the core countries or the core activities are concentrated in a few countries that we can easily identify. Historically, these have been countries of Western Europe. Later on, Japan joined that core. But after that, not much more has changed in the core. It has remain basically a club of elite countries. And it seems that um, uh, entry to that club is 
historically no longer possible. Although we come to be questions about China later, if we do have the time, the time to do that. The periphery, on the other hand, has been expanding. So you might imagine that the world system is not the fiscal globe. It is a, an area of that globe that is defined by an actual division of labor within which the different parts are interrelated according to specific functions within that system. And that space, that actual division of labor, has been expanding over time to the point that while it was still geographically quite limited in the 1800s, by the 1900s, thanks to the, eight, the era of imperialism, what we know as a scandal for Africa, etc., etc., it had, been, had expanded very, very much. And by 2000, I deliberately made it this, this big, because by 2000, we have China in there. Question is, can it, can it expand any further? At this point in time, we might say that it, it has cover the entire globe, physical globe. It has completely um, coincided the economic sphere and planet Earth. That is why we have to talk about that later on, about asymptotes, whether expansion is still possible. The second is that the world system is not also the same as the world order or the interstate system. Uh, the interstate system exists as relationships of countries. And we have observed that in the last few centuries, there have been moments, extended periods of time, when the world order was dominated by a single power that had all types of power within it. Economic power, political power, military power, and even cultural power. And that situation is what you call a hegemony. A country that possesses all of those powers by itself and dominates the world through those types of power is a hegemonic power, and we can see in history that um, in the, since the 17th to the present, there have only been three hegemonic powers, UP, UK, and US. UP is the United Provinces of the Dutch, Amsterdam of they came out to be the hegemonic power after the defeat of Spain, of the Habsburgs, in the Thirty Years' War that was in the early 17th century. The Thirty Years' War was something between, I think, 1618 to 1648. This was a struggle for European supremacy. And had the Habsburgs won, the interstate system would have been very different. It would have been a world empire. And a world empire would not have made possible a world system that was capitalist in nature of the kind that it has taken shape and form. Because that attempt of the Habsburgs failed in 1648, and there was the Treaty of Westphalia, which defined once and for all the interstate structure of the world order. This type of capitalist development became possible. The United Provinces dominated that system for a while, but after that lost out as the system expanded transatlantic, transpacific. The Dutch turned out to be too small for their own. Two powers contested with each other to take on that hegemonic position. 
and that was France and England. The Napoleonic Wars, which were so destructive and so significant in so many ways, can also be seen as the struggle for hegemonic control between France and England. And when Napoleon lost in 1815, the UK became the hegemonic power and for quite a long time. Now, I would then like to talk about, I'm going very rapidly, if you don't mind, um, because uh, I'd like to concentrate on, on the topic, which is uh, the crisis of the world system. Um, the uh, one way by which we can and understand the development of the world system is in terms of its rhythms, its periodization. And the most important of these rhythms, because there are many cycles and rhythms in economic development, as you know, there's the product cycle and the industrial cycle and the um, uh, most favorite uh, for the economists with their um, upswing and downswing and so, and so on. There are so many of those uh, cycles, but they should be plotted against a very long period of time, which world system theorists like Emmanuel Wallerstein and others, uh, Giovanni Aditi, have identified as a Kondratiev wave, a long wave. Kondratiev was a Russian economist active during the Stalin period and ended up as a victim of the Stalin period. Uh, whether that meant that he was onto something very, very good, uh, that was what happened to him. Anyway, uh, his, he was able to discern um, by studying all types of indicators of the global economy, he was able to discern this a pattern pattern that went on for almost like a hundred years with an upswing and a downswing which they call an A phase and a B phase and he thought that the development of the world system as it expanded over time also developed in terms of these waves of development the K waves, the Kondratiev waves so I'm just talking here now about the last complete Kondratiev wave with its B phase and its A phase between 1860 <coughs> to 1960-1970. This period is significant for us to understand what is going on in our own period, which is also from 1960 to where we are now. Of course, if we were to extend this graph this way, you would have these waves as well for the previous centuries. And so this hegemonic domination of Holland would be somewhere here, and UK would be here. Very important in the world system is that there should be leading industries which make a lot of money. Capital accumulation, which is the logic of this system, requires as a precondition businesses that make a lot of money. And I put the emphasis on a lot. Because countries may have businesses, there's market, market mechanism operates has been operating for centuries, but if profits are not so big, there is no dynamism for an expansion of the economy that would put everything up. You need leading industries to do that. In the early epoch, in the 1800s, the leading industry, as you know, of course, from your history in the Industrial Revolution, was the steam engine and the product was cotton 
and that was the basis of that imperialism of the West at that time, sufficient to conquer the rest of the world. By the time of the British Empire, 1900s, the leading industry was railway and steel. So you had those steel barons, you had those uh, railroad kings and so on. That was the industry, leading industry that brought, that had dense networks of forward and backward linkages, enough to really tightly define the, uh, the economy and put them, put them up. So that was the upswing of that period. The problem with leading industries or monopolistic or quasi-monopolistic industries is that they don't last for very long, long. No matter how much you have concentrated control over the industry, comes a time when other entities are able also to do the same. And so by that time, the, uh, the expansive dynamism, meaning the profits, the, the magnitude of profits that can be made, slow down. And when you slow down, then the economy slows down. Until the next leading industry is discovered, and new actors come into play, and new monopoly structures come up, and then the rest of the economy again is brought up. And after the railway and steel industry, what you have was the electrical engineering and industrial chemicals industry, which by this time, <coughs> the Germans were very, very good at. So, just looking at this period, you have already a decline of that uh, period. You had the Great Depression between 1873 and 1896. A Great Depression that struck hard Europe, struck hard British Empire. Um, you know, before that, Britain was known as the workshop of the world. It was the industrial um, dynamo of the world. By, by this time, it had lost steam. And uh, Britain shifted instead from being a manufacturer and producer to a financial center. But this is again very, very important because we will see later on that when manufacturing, production of goods slows down, but there's still a lot of money around, but not finding any investable opportunities in production, it shifts to finance, money making money. And that's a symptom of the dynamism of the world system. In any case, for Britain, it worked very well. For quite a while, Britain was the bankers of the world, or the bankers to the world. And despite the fact that there was already a slowdown of the world economy, they had uh, an option. This period from the 1890s to the 1914 period was what they call La Belle Epoque. The beloved period of artists, writers, you know, romantic and so on. Kind of mini series you see on television of the upper classes and how well they live. Well, that was the Belle Epoque. Rolling Twenties comes later <laughs> in America. Yes, please. I know about the y axis. Y axis here is a system of indicators of economic growth. So not only one. Not only one. Kondratchev actually had a very, um, very complex set of um, uh, indicators. And it's very, very difficult to do because most of these indicators are national statistics. And the world system is more than just an agglomeration of national statistics. So, uh, a, 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 a pattern has to emerge after a very thorough analysis of all of these indicators. So those indicators convey individually or similarly? No. Because this, there is yeah. only one curve. Exactly. Uh, this does not mean that every country follows the same. In fact, by the very nature 
even when the world economy is going down or uh, declining, other parts of the world are actually, in that sense, on an upswing. You will see that later on when we talk about uh, East Asia and China now, precisely. But that is more like, it's not an exception. It is rather symptomatic of the, of the general system as it goes. So you have this Belle um, um, which came crashing in 1914, uh, because of course of the war. And that war was what? That war was a struggle for hegemonic supremacy between the United States and Germany. Germany, of course, being very, very strong in electrical engineering and industrial chemistry, and the US very, very strong in railway and steel. <coughs> anyway, before I proceed further, one way by which, uh, okay, I mentioned earlier that the Britain went into finance capital as a way of getting its economy moving and as a source of big money. That was what Lenin analyzed very well in his uh, book on imperialism, where he talked about finance capital, industry, and so, so on. Lenin, by the way, if you have read him or want to take a look at him, talks a lot about the Philippine Revolution, 1896, and how this was captured by the Americans who were out to go now to conquer the Pacific. Last year, for a conference on Rizal, I wrote a paper where I said that Rizal also understood that there was a phenomenon emerging which was different from the anti-colonial struggle that they were pursuing at that time, which was imperialism. Uh, I came across uh, some drafts, unpublished writings of Rizal, where he analyzed, where he spoke of the rivalry between the United States and Germany over the Pacific, over an island called Samoa, where those two countries almost came to war with each other, over an island which was totally useless in terms of economic resources, but was, was right smack in the middle of the Pacific, and therefore was just perfect for an imperial geopolitical, geostrategic plan of naval supremacy. Now, because of that, this is a diversion from my talk, I think it was for that reason that Rizal was very skeptical about the anti-colonial revolution that we were then making. Because, as he said, you get rid of one colonial power and you fall into another, even more powerful, imperial power. When he was asked, when, when he was approached in the Pitan by the Capiconeros to join the revolution in Hebe, and he asked where are the weapons coming from, and they said Japan, Rizal knew that Japan had also become an imperialist power. Because this was in 1894, when Japan struck at China to get Korea. And 1895, in the Treaty of Shimonoseki, China gave up to Japan. And this was all inter-imperialist rivalry. Rizal was in the Pitan exactly at that time. So for them to be approached and to be said, we have an evolution, we have weapons, they're coming from Japan, Japan will help us. <coughs> Lenin has a very interesting remarks to say about that precisely, about the uh, dilemma in which we, our nationalist movement, found ourselves. Okay, back to this. Anyway, uh, this was a period of imperialism. 
you had the First World War. Of course, at that time it was not known as the First World War because they didn't know that a second war was coming. It was the Great War. Many would call it an inter-imperialist war. Totally destructive. But in America, and somebody said a while ago, Roaring Twenties, America was, of course, undisturbed by this war. And there was a boom again in the economy, and those were the Roaring Twenties. Except that, as Keynes was saying even then, and his was a lonely voice in the wilderness, he was saying this boom will not last. And of course it did not last, because by 1929 came the crash. So this is the low point of that period of the Conrad Jeff wave, which, if you see, is actually, if you link the First World War, 1914, and the Second World War, ending in 1945, you have a 30-year war. Because those two should really be seen in this perspective as one continuing struggle for hegemonic supremacy. So just as you had the 30-year war that decided the fate of Europe at that time and the world, you also have this 30-year war that decided that after the war, the United States would be the supreme hegemon. So, we come now to the age of Pax Americana. Do you have time? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here now, under the U.S. umbrella, of course the first thing we had to do was to come to terms with another power, no longer Germany. Germany was demolished, and Germany was going to be a, 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 a loyal ally of the United States, but the Soviet Union. So there had to be an accord between the two powers, and that was at Yalta, where it was agreed that <coughs> The Soviet Union would be in charge of the East, and only the East, and nowhere else. And the United States would be in charge of the rest of the world. Basically, it was like one-thirds, two-thirds uh, uh, structure. From that point on, the world economy under American hegemony had a tremendous upswing. Never before had there been this type, type of expansion. Um, it was just went on and on and on, and not just in the U.S., but everywhere. In the West, or Western Europe, there was reconstruction. You know, of course, Germany was destroyed. Uh, Japan had a nuclear holocaust. And yet, within a few years, they were up, and their economies were booming. Western Europe, Western powers, reconstruction of the economy, and so on. In Eastern Bloc, we cannot deny there was tremendous achievement in industrial development and in the, in, in the, in the uh, uh, material conditions of existence of the people there. And in the South, Philippines included, we did believe that life was getting better. This was the whole idea of third world development. We believed that we within this system could also have a takeoff. It's what we call takeoff. On the world scale and ourselves, on our efforts in relation to the world economy. So it was in fact a tremendous upswing. The leading industry at that time was the automobile industry. And of course, to get the automobile running, you have the petrochemical industry. And this was very much in the hands of the United States. This was again the leading industry and the monopolistic structure. But then again, after a while, the monopoly system becomes, shall we say, uh, undermined by other competitors. And before you knew it, Volkswagen was up, Toyota was up, Detroit was down. These are just iconic you know, uh, names I mentioned to explain or to illustrate a general development. A 30 year upswing, never before. Most of us, not most of us, uh, 
some of us here. <laughs> started life around this time. And we thought that life was like that. We thought that every year would be better. We thought that um, the economy was something that had an inner dynamism that would bring us to better and better future. And for most of you, that's probably all that you have known in the world. Against a long historical background, you will realize that that, is, that period is exceptional. We have been living an exceptional period. We have not lived earlier than that, where we have seen disaster. We have not lived earlier than that. We live at this period of the upswing. So this is our general orientation of what life is all about. But there comes this downturn and that's about the 1970s when the indicators that the Chancellor was asking a while ago, the indicators of economic growth, of investment in productivity, in investment in production, and so forth and so on, show that there was now a decline. The growth rates of the US and the Western world dropped by one half. There was a problem of absorption of surplus. There was a problem of um, um, uh, over, over capacity of uh, production. Because the problem with the world system is that the market does not get developed fast enough to absorb the tremendous productive capacity of the system. So very quickly, there's a glut, not because people uh, are, are lacking to buy, but because those people who want to buy don't have the purchasing power to buy. That's because of the inegalitarian exploitative structure of the world system. So it really has internal to itself those limitations to its own nature to expand. Anyway, um, the very important event here was 1968. 1968, of course, don't remember this very well, he was probably in Europe at that time, uh, was a tremendous wind that blew across the world and uh, challenged everything that had been set up under this structure. In the West, of course, workers and, and, uh, and uh, students and so forth and so on, they were out denouncing the system. In the East, you also had Czechoslovakia and so on. And in the South, you had national liberation movements and so on. So that this uh, world order that had been uh, carefully structured, engineered by the United States, came into real challenge. And from that moment on, you see uh, US and Germany in a decline. Now, what does um, capital do when um, the profits that they were used to are no longer as big as they are? Well, number one, you cut down costs. And these are labor costs. What Europe did, Germany did, and so on, was to open up their frontiers and to let migrant labor in. The Turks were allowed to Germany, the Greeks, and so forth, so on. That was a way of lowering labor because German labor was already very, very expensive. That was one way by which they could lower their costs. So, immigrate. The second is relocate. They move out of their traditional um, geographic centers to other parts of the world where labor is cheap and uh, the rate of profit again is high. So that is the expansion that will be seen from the core countries. Activities of core countries move to the semi-periphery. Uh, I've written a paper on this uh, on, on Asia in the, world, in the world system where I talk about South Korea and Taiwan, Hong Kong, 
and Singapore as part of the semi periphery and was the beneficiary of this expansion of capital uh, that went on in the 60s, 70s, 80s and allowed them to reach those levels of growth that they actually did, uh, which is again uh, another way by which capital can recover its dynamism. And the third is concentration of capital. Uh, smaller companies get eaten up by the big ones. Uh, they call this rationalization, restructuring, and so forth and so on. But what happens is that you end up with a corporate structure which is extremely monopolistic in nature. And you, for instance, you see in the automobile industry, so many good industries, so many more very good automobiles, they disappear. Uh, as only a few uh, remain. And uh, the uh, third is that um, uh, to fight against additional costs, which uh, in this case is posed by the problem of taxation. Because taxes have become so high and are impinging on the productivity and the profitability of countries, there had to be a uh, pushback, a pushback of the uh, welfare state system because this is of course uh, sustained by taxation and corporations pay those taxes and they want them to be cut back. So what you have here is that in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, you had the likes of Margaret Thatcher coming out in a movie soon, uh, and Ronald Reagan, re-engineering the whole thing, throwing overboard the Keynesian policies that had been basically the type of economic policy of the US at that time, and going into monetarism, neoliberalism, minimalist government, retrenchment of the welfare state system, cut back on taxes, etc., etc., etc. We are still there right now. It's happening in Germany, in, in Greece, austerity measures, the, uh, in Spain, the Los Indignados, uh, Wall Street movement. Those are reactions of people to being deprived of what they had gotten used to at that time. So you have a neoliberal reaction here, which, of course, for a while showed again recovery, right? So that in the 80s, you have recovery here until it crashed in 1989. The recovery again, mostly in East Asia, until it crashed in 1996 with the financial crisis of Southeast Asia. Recovery again, and this is what, in fact, people will call the Belle Epoque of our century. The Belle Epoque of the very rich and famous in the mostly Western countries and mostly in the financial banking sector. They really lived it up. There was so much money, but this money could not go into manufacturing because profitability was down. So, like in the previous century, money becomes the business in itself. There was so much money, they were pushing everybody to borrow. Third world countries, socialist countries, uh, junk bonds of corporations, the U.S. itself, now we have this huge debt problem. You see, they succeed only to fail. Schumpeter made this very famous remark that the failures of capitalism follow from its successes. This is a success, but then it fails. This is a success, it fails. This is a success, it fails. We are right now here at the bottom. We don't know where we are. Uh, there's uh, total confusion in, in Europe. They don't know whether the Euro will survive, and therefore the European community as well. The US has been, well, the Obama drama, uh, not so long ago, about the US losing its uh, uh, five-star rating. France now, everybody actually is in real danger. You have bankruptcies like uh, Iceland, um, totally unimaginable. Uh, so you have all kinds of problems here I don't want to talk about. The point is that, what happens now? Can we expect another upswing? We do have leading industries now, which are, uh, of course, ICT. Five minutes. 
Of course, again, this is a tremendous uh, monopoly system. You have what, five people who are super, super rich. Uh, Facebook and Mr. Gates and... <laughs> If they didn't in the top of our two hands, they are the biggest, biggest, biggest uh, capitalists. But even then, you see that the computer industry again has spread out, uh, again has gone to Taiwan and so on and so on. So uh, the same thing, um, the, 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 the search of profit again uh, dissipates, showing really the tendency of the falling rate of profit that marks analyze the capital. The question then is, what happens? Can we expect another uh, upswing? Well, the problem is that in terms of the history of the system from 1450, let's say, to where it is now, we have reached the asymptotes of the system. We can keep on going in a curve like this, but you can't go any further. Why? We have taken up the entire periphery. We have taken up China. China's success may be a great success for China, but we know that it is causing a lot of problems for the rest of the world. Here's a book that was written by uh, Minky Lee, who uh, uses a world system perspective uh, to, to analyze. The title is very good, The Rise of China and the Demise of the Capitalist World Economy. He sees the, 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 the rise of China as part of this system, but precisely because what matters is there in the center, that uh, the, the, the world system still cannot get out of the chaos that it is in. Wallerstein says, and I think stop here, Wallerstein says that in a period of chaos, which is, you don't know anymore, the, the equilibrium points have kind of disappeared, um, uh, and there are so many cycles that um, uh, are revolving and not a clear thing coming out, in a period of complexity, he says, what can happen is that the system bifurcates. When it bifurcates, it means that it can go this way, it can go that way. We are, he says, in a period of bifurcation. We don't know where it's going to end. Uh, we don't know, but he thinks, we, you may disagree with him, he thinks that it's impossible to have the upswing anymore. And that what will happen is that the system will have to change itself. The system will have to change itself. This logic will have to be rethought, redeveloped, redone. It's not going to happen within a few years. Look, it takes 30 years to do this, to get out. It could, it could easily take us 30 years to get an upswing or that bifurcation, which we hope we lead to a better world. And that's all. Thank you.